that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And for and in this life it and in this life eternal that they might know thee the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gave me to do. Oh now and now, Father, glorify thou me in thy own self with the glory which I had with thee before the foundation was. Jesus know the glory of God. He's telling us that he know the glory of God. Uh, the glory he know that he found in, 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 in God. The glory that he knows. It is not in, just in experience because he knows the glory of God. He knows God because he is God. So he knows about himself. He knows the value, the depth, the 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 the, the treasure. Of words is not even enough to describe all that we can get in the glory of God. Why it's so important in in this John seventeen, Jesus really he really go and emphasize about this glory. My brothers and sisters. I encourage you to read all the, the the chapter of John 17. So Jesus talked about, he didn't just talk about something he didn't know about. Not only he experienced, but he is also the glory of God. He carries the glory when he was on this earth. He's telling the Father, glorify me so I can glorify you. That's all it's about, my brothers and sisters. When God share, when God shine his glory on us, it's not for us to go around and be prideful about it. It, it, will, it will depart because God do not, go, do not deal with pride. We know very well about that. We know because Satan experienced that. That's how he was cast out. So we got to be very careful. We can enjoy his glory, his presence, but it's not for us to boast in ourselves. So we see that Jesus experienced when he was on this earth. He knows about the glory of God, his glory, and he never wanted to be separated from it, not at all. And that's why he was praying, like I said before, in the Garden of Gethsemane, saying, let this cup pass from me. There was no glory in, in uh, being crucified on the cross. It was very painful. Ah, he never wants to depart from, from the Father and his glory. So my brothers and sisters, friends, like I say, even Satan knows what it means to be in the glory of God. And if you turn to the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel 28, verse from verse 13 to 15. And thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the um, onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the, the car, carbuncle, and the gold, and the workmanship of thy tablets, of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day thou hast thou was created the other anointed cherub that covered and have said thee so i have said thee so thou was upon the holy mountain of god thou has walked up and down in the midst of the stone of fire thou was perfect in thy ways and from the day that was created till 
till iniquity was found in thee. You see, Satan, he experienced the glory of God. He was there in heaven with God. He knows. He knows the value of presence of God, of glory of God. He knows it so well. If any other um, angel know about, he was the one. You see the description. You see where he walked. He was there, the mountain of God. He had such great privilege until iniquity was found in, in him. We know the story about how he was cast out. I just want to illustrate about even him, even Satan. He knows. He knows the value. He knows the weight. He knows the experience. He knows it so well. And because he knows it, because he knows the the um um the glory of God so, so well that there's no way he will never 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 be able to enjoy what he enjoyed before he lost that forever he lost that glory forever and that's the reason he's so selfish and he don't want, he doesn't want man to experience what he had in heaven he is so jealous of man to know because he knows to know when we come to Jesus, our final destination will be what he lost in heaven will be because that's where our final destination that we will be basking in the glory in the presence of God forever and ever and ever and ever and ever till eternity. He knows that and he's so jealous of that. He doesn't want Man to experience that. He's selfish and jealous of man. We will be in heaven. And that's where we we should be on every day. Every day. This is what we should be in endeavor to work our salvation with fear and, and trembling so we can get to that final destination. We are the one who will be basking in that glory. You know what, my brothers and sisters? Angels do not have the ca capability to repent. Otherwise, I think even Satan would have repented. But he can't. He can't. He can never go back. And get back what he had. What he once known. He can't. That's why he's so angry. That's why he's so furious. That's why he's so jealous. Because he know the good things. He have experienced it. He have tasted. And so many don't even know yet about his glory. And he's there pushing, doing all that he can to block, to distract, to pull away. Man, the souls of man, so they didn't get to, to experience that, so they didn't get that true joy, that true life, that eternal life with God. We, however, we, as human beings, we are made in the image of God. We do have the capability to repent when we sin. Especially children of God. We have the Holy Spirit in us. That will give us that, you know, little pinch. Say, you know, what you did was wrong. Repent. We should always quick to repent. If we really know the value of glory of God, if we really know the value of his presence, we will quickly repent so that we could be in right standing with the Lord. And obtain that blessing. That blessing that God's having his glory. Satan lost that forever. That's it. Forever. He will never get that. that. So that jealousy in him is what's pushing him to hate man so much. Because we are made in God's image. And we also have the opportunity, even when we fall, we have the opportunity, as long as we still have breath in us, to come back to God and repent. And he, ha he has a heart.
to forgive us of our sins. Therefore, he, on a daily basis, he's about his business. He's about to destroy man. The Bible says he come to steal, kill, and destroy. And he's doing a great job. He's doing an excellent job with that. It is for us not to fall into his trap. It is for us to follow Jesus Christ and follow the road that Jesus has paved for us. He also comes with all kind of distraction to keep us out of God's will, of God's will and God, uh, of God's purpose, to keep us in sin. He knows the greatest thing that keeps man separated from God is sin. And he's doing a great job. Whatever. He's busy trying to keep men from accepting Jesus. Because you know what? Jesus is the antidote of, of sin. So he, therefore, he has all kind of things he's laying out. All things to cause men to think that's the glorious life. To take, to, for men to think, oh, this is the best life ever. You could live your best life ever with all the... Uh, you could have all the bling, all the bling bling, all the gold, all the diamond, all the, the cars, uh, the big mansion, all the money, all the drugs, all the alcohol, all the women, all the men, all the fornication, all kind of things. Oh, yes, this is your best life. You don't have a care in the world. Just enjoy your life. There's only one life to live. Live your life. That's the deception that many are following. They are following him. And they don't even realize they are being deceived. Because he has that great jealousy over us. Because he knows. He knows what's in the glory of God. He knows what it entails, my brothers and sisters. So he's trying to keep man this distraction keep them in sin in in iniquity anything that against god he presents it and sometimes he dress it up cover it up make it shiny or make it smells good when it is when it actually is filthy sin sin but he dress it up and many are following it is sad he's also trying to keep man from fo focus on other things so that they don't seek after that glory all kind of other things running after money chasing after fame chasing after big name chasing all kind of things and keep them distracted so that the real the real thing that's val that has value in life the presence of God, the glory of God, many are not seeking it. There is no wonder God told us, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. He knows what he's talking about. Of course, he's our creator. He knows. He knows what it entails, the value, the benefits that we could have. But many are not in, taking heed to the word of God. they rather listen to their flesh they would rather listen to to the world they would rather following the crowd rather to stay in that narrow path that jesus had already prepared for the children of god the children of obedience that yet yeah, the biggest thing is the distraction mm -hmm. Because he knows once we have been in the glory of God, <laughs> anyone who has been in the glory of God, in the presence of God, it will be very, very hard for Satan and all his falling angels and all his demons to take, to take that person out. Or even try to distract the person. 
no more he will be able to distract them. No, not, not, not. He, he can't. Because of once an, anyone experienced the glory, the presence of God, there's no going back. He knows it will be a losing battle. So my brothers and sisters, pay close attention to the distractions in our lives. We need to pay close attention to the distractions in our lives. They come in all kinds of shape, size, and form. In this world, we gotta we have to pay close attention because there's a greater underlying factor or meaning which is to keep us from experiencing the glory of God. But you know what? King <clears throat> David he experienced the glory of God. Why do you think he did everything possible, no matter what? No matter what it took, he did not want to lose the presence of God. He was quick to repent. Yes, he sinned, he did whatever, but when he come, he did not play with God. He knew he had to go back and repent, do what he had to do to get back on track because he had taste of the glory of God. Oh, he tastes the glory of God. In Psalm 51, in Psalm 51, Verse 11. Psalm 51, verse 11. See, cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Is it someone who had experienced the glory? That's what I'm talking about. Once taste that glory, there's no way you have to keep going back. You try to maintain it, retain it. <sighs> ah. He said, do not cast me away from your presence. He knew. He knew the presence of God, what it entails. He knew that peace, that joy. Oh, why you think that David come and dance before the Lord? Why is it that he didn't care about anything? You know, like, just come naked as he is. I'm not talking literal naked, meaning like he doesn't hold anything, any kind of sin, whatever he did, whenever he falls short, he just quickly go, Lord, forgive me. He cry out from the depth of his heart. He cry out because this presence meant so much for him. All this king, all this kingdom, he has all, all this authority. Yeah, that didn't mean anything to him as much as he treasure the presence of God. My brothers and sisters, we ought to treasure the presence of God. The presence of God is not just going to come because, because we say something, you know. We got to go after it. We got to spend time with him. We got to spend time in communication with him. In his word, in worshiping and meditating Oh, we got to spend time. He's just not going to reveal himself into just anybody. Because remember, the Lord is the one who searches the heart. He got to see the heart first before he appears. Ah, it's not something just like this, like that. It's something precious. It's glorious. It's awesome. And this is... Like, like King David never want to depart from that. Oh, no. Hmm. His presence is wonderful. Apostle Paul experienced the presence of God. And we saw the work that he did. He didn't care even about death anymore. He didn't care. It's like... Death doesn't mean anything to me. Having remember when um, he met um um Jesus on the road to Damascus, that the 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 power of God fell on him, and he was never the same after that. He changed completely, a new man, sold out, fully, fully devoted to do the work of the kingdom. He never pointed to himself; always point back to God. To Jesus. It was no longer about him. It was no longer about him. Um, I just want us to turn to. Book of um, Romans. 
Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. If we look at verse um, verse 31. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his um his own son, but deliver him up for all um for us all, how shall he not be with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God elect? Is it God that justify? Who is who is he that con condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of, of God, who also make intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or, 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 or sorrow? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, all these things we are more than conquerors through him that love us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor nor things present nor things to come nor height or death or any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus Christ of Lord because you've already have an experience with God because you would not be so persuaded like this that nothing can come between us and God when we fully devoted ourselves, when we fully you walking in his ways and in obedience, this is a kind of persuasion. We should be persuaded just like Paul. We should know because he have already experienced, he've gone through some experience in the presence of God. And for him to be able to speak so boldly like this, uh, this is a man who had been in the presence and experienced the glory of God. In 2 Corinthians, Paul say further, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8 and 9. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body as and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, that we may be accepted of him. You see, right now, he didn't care about death. He's like, all I want is to be in his presence. Whether I'm dead or, or I'm alive, I don't care. So if we live the life of Christ, if we live the life Christ wants us to live, so it shouldn't matter when we die because eventually as i said before our final destination will be to be in the presence of god to be in the after all said is is done at the end when eternity is eternity we will be in the presence of god and that's what should matter to us and that's what um that's what paul was able to say that he's keeping his eyes on the price he's keeping it that's the price the price is to be in his glory, to be in his presence. There is no other higher calling than that. There is no other great joy and prize than that. Nothing this life has to offer can compare to that. Nothing Satan and all his thing that he think he can give. Yes, even he dared to 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 um bribe Jesus and say, bow down and worship me. I will give you all these things. Nothing. When we know about his glory, when we've experienced his glory, there's nothing uh, anybody can offer us in this world that should cause us to leave that treasure and go run after things that will perish. His glory is forever. It's for, it's, it's, a, it's for eternity. It will never cease. Never. 
So we ought to hold on to that. Cherish it. Go after it. You see, Apostle Paul said, even if I'm dead or I'm alive, the main thing is to be in his presence. So there is, there is something significant beyond good by being in his presence. It's beyond words can describe to be in his presence. Hallelujah. My brothers and sisters, if we only know, if we only can experience it every day, we will be seeking his presence. Every day. Let's look at Psalm 16. Psalm 16, verse 11. Psalm 16, verse 11. Thou will show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At that right hand there are pleasure forevermore. So if we're really looking for pleasure, if we're really looking for joy, it's in the presence of God. We need to go after it. We need it. We need his presence in our lives, my brothers and sisters. That should not be a second thought. That should be our way of life. It should not be an experience. We want to experience that and then we go back about, about our lives, about our business. It should be a continuous thing for us as his children. We should never want to live without his presence. You see? That's what he wanted to do for the children of Israel when he had called them in the wilderness. But then it was only Moses who went up. He went up to the mountain. And when he came back, because his pre the presence of God was so strong on him, he had to put a veil. He had to put a veil over his face because his gl the glory just, just radiated all over him. That's the kind of experience that God wants us to have as his children. If you look in Exodus um, chapter 34, verse 29 and 34, and you will read um, what the, the Bible say when Moses came down from the mountain, when he was giving um, the commandments, he came down with all the glory because he had been in the presence. He was so radiant. All that was all over him. What a gracious God who wished to reveal himself to his children. To cause us to have a taste of heaven even right here while we're on earth. My brothers and sisters, if we only knew what we are missing, we would have given up everything, everything of this world. And go after that glory. The glory of God is not just for a few. Like Moses. Like Apostle Paul. It's not just for a few. But it's a, a, like King David. You know all those men and women. Who had experienced the glory in the presence of God. It's not just for them. It's for us too. For everyone. All of us who come to Christ. We should experience. Because Jesus always pointed us to the Father. That's the reason he always pointed us to the Father. Because he wants us to experience that glorious Father we have in heaven. He wants us to receive even right here while we're on earth. We could still experience. So we got to go after it. We got to want it. We got to live the life so we can receive and be in his presence like that. When we are in his glory... Nothing else matters, my brothers and sisters. Nothing else in this world will matter when we experience his glory. Because in the glory realm, there is no sickness. There is no pain. There is no, oh, because, oh, we don't have time to think about our woes, our troubles. Because all we can think about is him and enjoy him. So, 
it is no wonder that I say that Jesus wants us to have the real life. The real and true life is in his glory. His glory should not be an experience. I repeat, it should not be an experience. It should be our reality. That that is what makes us the diff. That's what makes us different from the children of Satan. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we thank you. We bless your holy name. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for this word tonight. I pray that. The Holy Spirit will help each and everyone who wants to know you more, to, to get into your glory, to live in your glory, or oh, to teach us how to get there. Lord, we need you more than ever before. We need your presence. Your presence makes a difference in our life. We know, Lord, my God, that you are not a respect of man. As you've done for others, you can do for us too. We ask you in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Good evening, my brothers and sisters. Good evening. The line is open right now. If anybody have a prayer request or testimony or have any questions about what we just shared tonight, now is the time. <clears throat> 